All righty, in chapter 12, we get to talk about radicals, which is where we will have reactions where we're just moving one electron, whereas in everything else, we've been moving pairs of electrons. This is also where we will start to see a little bit of the reactions of alkanes. Right, we've talked about alkenes, we've talked about alkynes in previous chapters, but we haven't talked about the other type of hydrocarbon very much, which is alkanes, which you know, due to the fact that they're not very reactive. But one of the ways they do react, and the predominant way that we will deal with them in this course is via radical reactions. And so we've got a shorter chapter, again, here in chapter 12. Um, we'll deal with alkenes, we'll deal with alkenes, probably four videos total. Um, and the big takeaway from this chapter we'll get in this video, which is predicting products of radical reactions. Yep. So we've talked about this a long time ago when we first introduced nomenclature and you know what a hydrocarbon is. It's just got carbon and hydrogen. Alkanes specifically are saturated. Okay. So they only have single bonds. There's no pi bonds anywhere, no double bonds, no triple bonds to give it the electron density to act as a nucleophile. And with only carbon and hydrogen, there's no polar bonds for it to act as an electrophile, you know, no delta positive anywhere, no significant partial charges. So these guys are pretty unreactive overall. Okay? So how do they still react? You know, I alluded to it in the beginning, it has to be via a radical mechanism. Okay? So we can see two examples of reactions of alkanes right here. We've got methane and then ethane. And alkanes can react with the halogens, chlorine or bromine, okay? not iodine or fluorine. We'll talk about those in a second. Okay? But notice, unlike a reaction with an alkene, for example, that we could take an alkene and react it with just chlorine or bromine, as we saw in chapter six. Here, when we're reacting with chlorine or bromine, we need heat right, represented by that delta symbol, or light. Okay, that's what that one represents, heat or light, in order for these reactions to proceed. Okay, so, and that's what's told to you right down here at the bottom of the slide, high temperatures or light. Okay. And the good news is for this chapter, for alkanes, that's pretty much the only reaction we have to worry about. They can do halogenations, they can also combust, right? We've seen combustion reactions of alkanes, but that's pretty much it, okay? But we will take a little bit of a deeper dive into these reactions, okay? But again, make sure when you're writing out a reaction, if it's an alkane plus chlorine or bromine, those are the only two you'll choose, you have to include heat or light of the appropriate wavelength, okay? So, We'll talk in a second about why these guys can undergo halogenation, but if we're going to be looking at a radical mechanism, we need some new terms that we're going to introduce and use within this chapter and make sure you're familiar with what each of these terms mean. Everything we've been studying so far where we move pairs of electron deals with heterolytic bond cleavage. So when we show, draw a mechanism and show a bond breaking here, for example, right, we show an arrow with two barbs indicating we're moving a pair of two electrons. Okay. But what we'll see in this chapter is homolytic bond cleavage, also known as homolysis, okay, where we can break this bond and instead of the pair moving together like it did up here, right, it splits and one electron goes each way. And notice that difference in the arrow. It's only shown with one barb because it's just one electron moving and that forms a radical. Okay? And a radical species has an atom with an unpaired electron, right? They don't like that. They're highly reactive because they wanna complete their octet. Okay? But this homolytic bond cleavage here is how we get radical mechanisms. It's critical to how alkanes react with halogens. Okay? This starts it all off. This is where the heat or the light comes in. So let's take a look at the mechanism. Okay. When we have right, that high temperature or light, that, in, that initiates what's known as a homolytic bond cleavage here between chlorine atoms. Okay. And that's called an initiation step. You should know each of the steps of 
a radical mechanism. Okay? It's initiation, propagation, and then what we have on the next slide, termination. So three steps, know them. Initiation, then propagation, then termination. Okay? So the heat or the light does a homolytic bond cleavage here between the two chlorine atoms. That gives me a chlorine radical. This chlorine radical, which is formed in the initiation step, is highly reactive. It wants to fill its octet. So it can do that in a propagation step by again initiating, you know, causing a homolytic bond cleavage here between either the hydrogen carbon bonds in methane in this mechanism okay, or other bonds as we'll see in a second, right? So we've got this chlorine radical and that can react with methane to form HCl. It's pulled off hydrogen with one of its electrons. So chlorine completed its octet here imagining another pair of electrons for that HCl bond. But in doing so, it formed a methyl radical. That methyl radical is highly reactive for the same reason. It wants to react further. So it can react with another chlorine system, right? To form a chlorinated methane here and a chlorine radical. And you can see how these, right, as these radicals react, they form more radicals. And that's how you can identify any step in a radical mechanism, what you need to be able to do. If there were no radicals to start, and then you formed a radical, that's an initiation step. If it was a radical in the reactants and a radical in the products, that's propagation, because the reaction is propagating, it's carrying on more and more and more. But then when you have two radicals that come together and there's no radicals in the product, that's a termination step. So this is how that reaction ends. You, radical reactions are hard to control. It's a game of probability, okay? because you can't control what bonds are going to be formed or break. You can do certain conditions to favor it, uh, but at the end of the day, it's just a game of probability. So if you have two radicals come together to complete octets, uh, that's called the termination step. Could happen with chlorines coming together to form Cl2. Could happen with two methanes coming together, methane radicals to come together to form ethane, or it could be a chlorine radical and a methane radical coming together to form okay, chloromethane here. So what I've just said verbally is represented here on slide seven, of initiation, propagation, and termination. Know the three steps of a radical reaction. Specifically, it's a radical chain reaction okay, because that chain reaction is happening with the propagation steps. It's happening over and over and over. So anything where you have radical intermediates and repeating propagation steps is a radical chain reaction. This reaction specifically would be called a radical substitution reaction because you substituted chlorine for hydrogen in your alkane, methane in this case. So if we go back and we look at the overall reaction, jumping all the way back to slide three here, Right, you substituted chlorine for hydrogen, so it's a radical substitution reaction that occurred via a radical chain mechanism. So how can, if it's a game of probability, what can you do to help control the reaction? Okay. Now, keep in mind, you can never be 100% selective. You're just playing the odds the best you can. Okay. If you want to just get a monochlorinated product, you use a large excess of the alkane because then the chance that it encounters a chlorine radical is lower. Okay. But the higher the concentration of the halogen you use, the greater the chance that you're gonna get something that's dichlorinated or trichlorinated or even tetrachlorinated. It's not very likely, but it could happen. That's all a game of probability. So if you want just one chlorine on your halogen, use an large excess of the alkane. This is for chlorine. We can do it for bromine as well. I mentioned you can do either of them, chlorine or bromine. This is what the mechanism looks like for bromination. This is nice because everything's shown just on one slide for us here on slide nine. Okay. But what do you notice? Well, we changed chlorine for bromine and we changed methane to ethane. But at the end of the day, the mechanism is exactly the same as chlorination. Heat or light are introduced for our radical initiation, the homolytic bond cleavage of that Br2 bond. Then we have propagation steps, okay? Bromine radical encountering ethane, 
ethyl radical encountering bromine. Okay. Possible termination steps, bromine radicals coming together, ethyl radicals coming together, or an ethyl radical and a bromine radical coming together. Okay. So you notice you always get some side products there, right? Your largest product is bromoethane in this case, because it's producing the termination step and a propagation step, but you're always going to get some of butane in this case, where your two radicals come together. This is why you can't be 100% selective. Okay. So how about radical stability? How does this affect our reactions? Okay. Well, the good news is that our radicals have the same stability as our carbocation. Right? We classify them the same way. Okay. Now, the differences in stability aren't as great as what we have for carbocations due to the fact that we have one electron in the antibonding molecular orbital, but we still do have that stability due to hyperconjugation. Okay, so at the end of the day, a more substituted radical is more stable. So tertiary radical is best, followed by secondary, followed by primary, followed by the methyl radical being the least stable. Okay. And again, it's due to that backbonding with hyperconjugation. And we can see the different stabilities for these things reflected in the percentages of the products that we get from radical mechanisms. And that's why this is important. Okay. What I mean by that is look at this coronation product. Okay. Now, if it were just a game of probability and there were no other factors at hand, right, I could pluck off any of these hydrogens and replace it with a chlorine in my monosubstituted product. Okay. So again, that's ignoring stability. That would lead to the expected percentages that are listed on top here. Okay. There are 10 total hydrogens in butane. Okay. To produce one chlorobutane, right, you would pluck off the terminal hydrogens, either here or here, thinking about the fact that in 3D, that would give you the same product, right? Just flip it around. So that's six hydrogens in total. So you would expect 60%, one chlorobutane, and then the four hydrogens in the middle, two and two, you would expect 40%, two chlorobutane. That's if it was just a game of probability and nothing else, okay? But obviously the stability is factor factoring in, because when we run this experiment, we see we don't get 60% one chlorobutane, right? we only get 29%. Two chlorobutane actually predominates at 71%. So that tells us that product distribution and what we're getting from these reactions doesn't depend solely on probability. It has to do with radical stability and what we can form more easily because two chlorobutane is formed via a secondary radical, whereas one chlorobutane is not. So if you look at the mechanism, you can see why, right? Two chlorobutane via a secondary radical, one chlorobutane by a primary radical, which is less stable. And removing the hydrogen to form the radical is the rate determining step, right? What's going on here or here? That's the slow step, that's the RDS, okay? And then going to your product here is the faster step. Okay. So whichever one of these is more stable, keeping in mind that the transition state in these or endergonic processes represents the radical, okay, the transition state is closer in structure to the radical itself, that means that the transition state is similar to the radical. Okay, so whichever one of these is more substituted is more stable, meaning the transition state is lower in energy, so it's easier to form. Okay. The same exact logic we used in previous chapters for carbocations. Okay, so if I can form a secondary radical faster, that product will predominate. Okay. So we have to factor in the stability as well as the probability. And for each reaction, you can experimentally determine the information, how these two factors come into play, right? Because if you know, you've got a tertiary radical, that's easier to form, sure. But if you also have, you know, 10, 20 other hydrogens that are all primary, you're still gonna get a lot of that because it's just the probability aspect. There's more of those hydrogens in solution. 
And for a chlorination reaction specifically, what it boils down to, if we consider a primary radical to be set to one, okay, because methyl radicals will only be methane and then all the hydrogens are the same. Think about a primary radical as being one, it's 3.8 times easier to form a secondary radical than a primary radical. And it's five times easier to form a tertiary radical if we're running them at room temperature. So then I can use that and actually do some math with these. Okay? And this is something you will be asked to do. Okay? Take probability and reactivity and factor them in together in order to determine the product distribution. Okay? I will ask you on a test to actually do this. Look at a structure, identify all of the different hydrogens, and all of the, the different products. Then use the number of hydrogens that are there multiplied by their relative reactivity okay, over the sum of them to predict the product distribution. Okay. So if I'm doing this for butane, right, I look at but the structure of butane. Uh, how many possible hydrogens could get me to one chlorobutane? Well, as we mentioned before, when you look at that, there's six, three on each side. Those six hydrogens would, are, would form a primary radical, right? so that has a relative reactivity of one. Six times one is equal to six. To get two chlorobutane, there are four hydrogens that could give me that, right? two on carbon two, two on carbon three. And those come by a secondary radical, which has a relative reactivity of 3.8. And so you multiply the number of hydrogens, the probability times the reactivity, 4 times 3.8 gives you 15. Then you add that up for however many hydrogens you do it for. Okay, so 21 in this case is my total. And then you can figure out the probability for each. 6 divided by 21 is 29%, 1 chlorobutane. 15 divided by 1 is 71%, 2 chlorobutane. Okay. So we see here the more substituted is more reactive. Okay. But of course, this is temperature dependent. This is the chlorination reactivity at room temperature. If you change the temperature, you can change those distributions. Okay. So here you can quickly calculate the percent yield for this reaction and you will be asked to do that. I will give you the relative reactivities, okay, which is shown yeah, right here on this slide. Right? Primary being one, secondary being 3.8, tertiary being five. That information I will give to you because if you temperature change, you change that. If you change it to bromine, as we'll see in the next video, I think it's listed there, it changes those numbers. Okay. But you can count the hydrogens, know if they're primary, secondary, or tertiary, and do the math to figure out these rates of distribution and predict the percentages. Okay. That's the big takeaway from this video and one of the most important things from chapter 12 and okay, knowing how to do that. Uh, the other thing I failed to mention before with radicals, you have to know the difference in stability, which is easy because it's the same as carbocations, but the benefit is they don't rearrange. We don't have to worry about radical rearrangement like we do carbocation rearrangement. Okay? Once they form, they stay. So know, right, this side right here, I'd say 15 is the most important thing from this video. Know that, no homolytic bond cleavage, no initiation, propagation, termination, and then you're gonna be well on your way for the rest of chapter 12. And we'll continue this in the next video talking about the reactivity selectivity principle.